Good evening, and welcome to the fourth show of the 15th annual Alpenglow Winter Speaker Series presented by Peak Design. My name is Brendan Madigan. I am the owner of Alpenglow Sports here in Tahoe City and your host this evening. Now, I have to say, it's exciting to have a show when multiple feet of snow have fallen out of the heavens. There have been a lot of losses in the last 10 months, um, but I like to focus on the wins and Fresh Pow sure does make everything just a little bit easier, I think, for everybody. For those of you who are new to us this evening, the Winter Speaker Series has a twofold goal. First is to inspire and motivate every mountain athlete to pursue their dreams and to educate about and raise funds for nonprofit organizations who make a tangible difference here in our North Lake Tahoe and Truckee communities. This season, our 15th, we've had three very inspirational shows from Dave Nettle, Cody Townsend, and Angel Collinson. And I'm here to tell you tonight is no different with extreme skiing hero, Ingrid Backstrom. We've also been able to partner with the best and brightest nonprofits here in the North Lake Tahoe area. And tonight's beneficiary, the Tahoe Fund, is at the top of the pile. So please remember that 100% of your giveaway purchases go to supporting the good work that the Tahoe Fund is doing here in our community. So if you feel all the feels, you can make an additional tax deductible donation to the Tahoe Fund at the link below. Now, I say this each show, but we literally could not put on the Winter Speaker Series without the help of some fantastic sponsors. For the second year running, we're lucky to have Peak Design as our title sponsor. Peak Design is a unique company that puts people before profit. They are certified B Corp, members of both 1% for the planet and climate neutral, and make best in class photography and travel gear. I encourage you to check them out online and support them and the good work they are doing in the world. We're also lucky to have the support of many core local businesses that allow our mountain community, which is now global in its reach, to come together for this special style of adventure storytelling. Our local sponsors include the Squaw Valley Property Owners Association, Tom, Tahoe Mountain Realty, Porter Simon Law, and I'd like to give Jim Porter a shout out here because not only was he instrumental back in the day of creating the Tahoe Truckee Community Foundation, but I believe he also sits on the board of the Tahoe Fund, where he gets his energy, um, I would like to know. Uh, also, Mike Schwartz and the Backcountry. Uh, Mike is family, not competition. KTKE 101.5 Truckee Tahoe Radio, Daniel Cates and Technical Equipment Cleaners, The Tahoe Weekly, Katie Rice and her team at Guild Mortgage, Evolve Design Works, Mount Lincoln Construction, a mainstay of support at the Winter Speaker Series, and Sierra Nevada Brewing. And while not local per se, We've also had the good grace of having uh, Smartwool and Nerona approach us to be sponsors again this season. And we're super grateful to have them believe in the speaker series and the mission. We should also thank Ingrid's generous sponsors for donating heavy tonight. These include the North Face, Vocal, Dalbello, Giro, Evo Gear. And I'd like to say not that these are sponsors of Ingrid's, but um, 
the Winter Speaker Series has legs this year and is reaching a lot of people. We have some great outreach from uh, Jack Wolfskin and Falky Socks as well, which I'm super grateful for. So at this point, I'd like to turn the floor over to Executive Director of the Tahoe Fund, the one and only Amy Berry. Amy, go ahead and give us all the smoke. Hi, thanks so much for joining us tonight. We're so excited to hear what Ingrid has to say. I'm Amy Berry, CEO of the Tahoe Fund. We are just so grateful to be the beneficiary of tonight's Alpenglow Speaker Series. For those of you that don't know, the Tahoe Fund is a nonprofit, and our mission is to use the power of philanthropy to improve the Tahoe environment for all to enjoy. So what do I mean when I say use the power of philanthropy? Well, in the last few years, we've used a few million dollars of private funding to help secure more than $50 million of public funding for critical environmental improvement projects all around Lake Tahoe. Projects that will help increase sustainable recreation. If you haven't been yet, you need to go onto that spectacular new East Shore Trail from Incline to Sand Harbor. We played a key role in helping make that happen with our partners. Uh, we're really focused on projects that are gonna help restore our forests. How can we increase the pace and scale of forest restoration to hopefully prevent a catastrophic wildfire from happening here? Lake Clarity, of course, Tahoe's blue waters, we wanna help ensure those are around for a long time. So projects like removing aquatic invasive species or working with our partners that clean up the lake to do a scuba cleanup of the entire circumference of Lake Tahoe. Transportation is also in our focus area. You know, we'd rather people spend time in Tahoe out of their cars rather than sitting in traffic in their cars. So we're looking at innovative solutions to help with that. And lastly, stewardship projects. How can we help people take better care of Lake Tahoe? Oh. I'm so excited to be joined by our Take Care Bear. If you haven't seen the Take Care Bear around town, he's helping us get the word out. Together with more than 50 partners in the region, we've developed a regional stewardship campaign that has messages that everyone can understand and enjoy. You might see the Take Care Bear out of Sled Hill, reminding people that they need to take their broken sleds home with them when they're done with the day on the hill. Or at a dog park, reminding people that they should be number one at picking up number two. Collectively, we're working together to make sure people understand the simple ways that they can help take care of Tahoe and make this a better place. And when COVID hit last March, almost a year ago, we took the time to pivot the Take Care campaign. So you may have seen signs all around Tahoe reminding people that they should go big on distancing, whether on a trail, a skin track, a chairlift, or at your local retailers. And to those of you that are watching that know the Tahoe Fund and have supported us, Thank you. We are so grateful to have your support to do great work for the region. And tonight, especially, we're so thankful to have the support of this speaker series for all the raffle tickets that you've purchased. All the money that we raised tonight will go to the Take Care Tahoe campaign. So thank you very much. Together, we really are going to create a legacy for generations to come. Here. <laughs> Awesome, thank you, Amy, and thank you for all the excellent work you're doing for our community. Uh, so now, as many of you love, uh, is the time for our raffle. But before we get into it, um, we've got some awesome stuff to give away. I wanna remind everyone of the chat feature um, uh, that's available tonight and drop in your questions um, for Ingrid uh, for our live Q&A afterwards and they can be upvoted. Um, but we love reading the banter, so definitely keep the, the, the fun comments coming. Um, first up, we have a his and her pair of Falky ski socks. Uh, these are valued at $75. And we also have um, a $25 gift certificate to Technical Equipment Cleaners uh, there in Truckee. And the winner there is Lynn Secreto. Congrats, Lynn. You can put those ski socks to use. Um, we love Lynn. She's the, the better half of uh, uh, our friend Lewis from San Francisco Running Company. Next up, we've got a duplicate of the same thing, his and her ski socks from Falky, as well as a $25 gift certificate to technical equipment cleaners. If you guys aren't familiar with cool, Familiar with technical equipment cleaners, they can clean anything. Your, your comforter, your horse blanket, you name it, your Gore-Tex. And Marissa Stender, they can clean whatever you need. Um, and congrats and come get your free socks. 
Okay, next up we have his and her black diamond beanies, um, as well as a $25 gift certificate to tech and a Jiro Snow net gator. That's about a $115 value. And our winner is Laura Dawson. Congrats, Laura Dawson. Next up, we have a Jack Wolfskin uh, waterproof rain shell. I don't have it to show you, but um, the generous folks there at Jack Wolfskin have kicked in a lot of great prizes tonight, as well as a $25 gift certificate to Technical Equipment Cleaners. This is a his and her, sorry, his or her piece. Uh, in this case, I think it's Bruce Chapin, unless you're uh, you're feeling generous tonight. Um, you can pick uh, whatever gender item you would like there from Jack Wolfskin. So congrats, Bruce, you're the winner. Uh, next up, we have another piece from Jack Wolfskin, a windproof down jacket, and that's valued at $200. Our winner of that awesome down jacket is Janice Anderson. Congrats, Janice, you're the winner. Okay, next up we have a $100 uh, gift certificate to Technical Equipment Cleaners. Uh, we've got a $100 gift certificate to Alpenglow Sports. And from our friends at Evo Gear, we have a uh, way out adjustable pair of backcountry touring poles and a gift card. So that's uh, about a $350 value there. And congrats, uh, Hannah Sullivan. You are the winner, Hannah. Super grateful for uh, for your participation again. Uh, next up, we have a Jack Wolfskin Atmos jacket valued at $200. Again, you can pick his or hers. And our winner is Andrew Beckwith. Congrats, Andrew. Our seventh raffle item is a North Face um, AT midweight full zip jacket for women and a $100 gift certificate to technical equipment cleaners. Our winner there is Shelly Schuler. All right, Shelly, I can drop that by your house and you can take it on your trip. That might have sounded inappropriate, um, but we love Shelly, so congrats. Uh, next up, uh, we have more fun stuff from Evo Gear for your next travel adventure. Uh, a roller ski bag that'll fit up to a 200 centimeter uh, ski as well as a boot bag. And that's a $300 value. Our winner there is Evan Swain. Congrats, Evan Swain. Next up, we have a awesome duffel backpack from our friends at Peak Design. This is valued at $220. It's a 65 liter adventure pack. And our winner is going to be Crew Stover. Congrats, Crew. Next up, we have his and her base camp duffels from our friends at the North Face. This is a $250 value. And our winner there is going to be Jim Boyd, congrats, Jim Boyd. You've got two epic duffels that are now yours for your next uh, adventure. Next up, we have a avalanche rescue course from our friends at Blackbird Mountain Guides. Uh, this includes breakfast and a lift ticket to Donner Ski Ranch, um, and it's a, about a $250 value. Blackbird is a new and exciting uh, local guiding option headed up by Zeb Blaze here in Tahoe. So our winner for the Avalanche Rescue Course from Blackbird Mountain Guides is, drum roll, Aaron Stiasny. Congrats, Aaron. Hopefully I pronounced your name right. <clears throat> okay, next up, we have a two-night stay at the Tahoe Vistana Inn, courtesy of our friends at Kelly Brothers Painting and Simple Power Solar. Uh, that's a $300 value, and you can come and stay here on the North Shore for our next powder cycle, which is right around the corner. All right, congrats, Laura Dawson. You're the winner of a great uh, stay there at the Tahoe Vistana Inn. Next up, we have a $100 gift certificate to Technical Equipment Cleaners. Um, 
love Daniel. Um, if you guys don't know Daniel, definitely stop into tech and talk to him. He is the man, as well as a Jack Wolfskin hybrid insulation jacket um, valued at $200. This is a $300 package. And our winner is Shelly Schuler. Uh, Shelly just won again, so she must have bought a, a lot of raffle tickets or have some really good luck. Congrats, Shelly. Wow, she did buy a lot of tickets, so she might even win again. Um, I'm being told anyway. Uh, next up, we have a North Face uh, Snowmad 23 Backcountry Touring Pack from our friends at the North Face. I'm sure Ingrid uses something similar to this, as well as a Lakey Guide Light uh, BC Touring Pole. This is uh, about a $400 package. And our winner is Wally Auerbach. Sorry, Walter Auerbach by the name, but I know Wally. Um, and Wally is the, um, the man at Auerbach Engineering here in Tahoe City. So thanks for your support, Wally. Uh, next up, we have a pair of beanies from Black Diamond, his and her beanies, as well as a Jack Wolfskin Argo Peak jacket. Um, the beanies are valued at 60 bucks. The, the Argo Peak jacket from Jack Wolfskin is valued at 350 So really nice package here. And our winner is Lou Basile. Congrats, Lou. I believe Lou is um, Jim Porter's partner at Porter Law Firm there in Truckee. Um, you guys are stoked and we're grateful for your support. Um, next up, we have a women's insulated pullover from the North Face, valued at 139 bucks, as well as a women's flight jacket made of their new um, Future Light waterproof breathable uh, material. This is a about a $500 package, and our winner is Andrea Luck. Congrats, Andrea. Um, you are stoked on some awesome gear from the North Face. Okay, now guys, we're getting into the, the super uh, high-end stuff. We've got a helmet goggle package here from Jiro. We've got um, uh, NV MIPS helmet, uh, valued at 280 bucks, and the Axis goggle at $190. And our winner there is going to be Zan Larkins. Congrats, Zan. We love Zan. Okay, next up we have a repeat, but uh, uh, even a little bit nicer package from our friends at Jiro, who's also, also uh, sponsor Ingrid here. Uh, we've got the um, grid MIPS and the contour goggle. This is almost a $600 helmet goggle combination. And our winner is going to be Emily Mallon. Congrats, Emily. You will be looking good in this helmet and goggle combo from Jiro. It's not uh, a coincidence that so we have a third kit from Jiro. They were super generous in their support of the speaker series, so thanks to Jiro. Um, we've got a MIPS helmet, an Ella goggle, and we've got $50 worth of gift certificates from our friends there at Technical Equipment Cleaners. The winner there is... Tongue Marriage. Congrats, Tongue Marriage. Um, I believe that's the better half of Chris Marriage. So congrats. You'll be looking good, and I know you can put that to use. Um, okay, guys, so the, our last two prizes are our heavy hitters. We have um, a pair of skis from Vocal. You can pick uh, any ski of your choice up to $750, I believe. Um, Vocal makes awesome, you know, lightweight touring skis that can also ski perfectly adept inbounds. And let's go ahead and pull the winner for the free pair of Vocal skis. All right, Douglas Johnston, you are the winner of a new pair of skis. Um, come on by the shop and we can, we can chat you through the options there. And our last prize um, from our friends at Dalbello Ski Boots, also a, a sponsor of Ingrid's, is the new Quantum Free 105 Backcountry Touring Boot. This is a women's boot valued at $800, and it's not available until next season. So you're technically getting a, um, 
a new boot that's not even available yet. So uh, let's go ahead and pull the, the winner there. All right, and our grand prize winner is Andrew Magliozzi. Uh, congrats, Andrew, you've just won an awesome pair of uh, backcountry ski boots that you um, hopefully will be um, gifting to your better half unless you have uh, very small feet. Okay, um, so at Angel's show last month, um, I spoke to the power of words and how they have real energy and impact. In the last month, I've come across a philosophical concept that was arguably popularized by Archbishop Desmond Tutu and Nelson Mandela called Unbutu. Now, I always knew that South Africans carried unthinkable societal trauma from their history of institutionalized racism, but I did not realize the role Ubuntu played as a guiding principle, one which allowed black South Africans to remain resolute and united in the face of such incomprehensible racial injustice. While it's difficult to translate directly into English, Ubuntu is not a word, but rather a way of life that includes the essential human virtues of compassion and humanity. Ubuntu tells us that a person is a person through other people, or in the words of Nelson Mandela, we are human only through the humanity of others. Mandela also says that if we are to accomplish anything in this world, it will be in equal measure due to the work and achievement of others. In short, the worldview says, not me, but we, that we are different so we can realize our need for one another. I think we are all living our little slice of Mbutu through the Winter Speaker Series, and I thank you for it. It's been an amazing season that I would have never anticipated before COVID hit. From Ingrid's inspirational show, which you're going to absolutely adore, to the over $70,000 we've raised for the Tahoe Fund this evening, we are collectively making our little corner of the world better and a more just place. Of course, there's still much, much work to be done, but if we can live Mbutu just a little in our daily lives, then we are more than a community we are more than a team. But now I'd like to invite you to please enjoy the one and only Ingrid Backstrom. Three, two, <laughs> one, hit it. Hi, um, thank you so much everyone for being here tonight. And thank you so much to Alpen Glow for including me in this year's slideshow series. It's definitely one of the best, longest running, most awesome slideshow series in all the land, if not the universe. Um, so I'm really honored to be here. Um, I want to thank my amazing sponsors, the North Face, Marker, Vocal, Del Bello, Giro, and Evo um, for all your support, without none of which um, the stories and pictures you'd see tonight would be possible. And also for all the fantastic raffle prizes they've donated, which hopefully you guys all won. And of course, I need to thank my husband, Jim, for a lot of things, but um, for being here tonight and being my audience in the room uh, live and direct. He's also the eye candy for the evening over here. So um, I really appreciate everyone taking time to be here tonight. I'm going to start at the very beginning, which is <laughs> way back um, in Alaska. I'm going to talk about four different kind of phases of my ski career tonight. I'll start at the beginning, talk about how I got here, um, and then talk about two really different trips that I've been on. One kind of earlier trip and one more recent trip um, from right before we started to, um, right before we decided it was time to try to start a family. Um, the last part will be a little bit about that transition from being a professional skier to being a professional skier and also a mom. 
And of course, I have to start at the very beginning. So here I am at a, probably about three or four years old, my dog Butch, in Alaska. I was born in Seattle, and then we moved to Anchorage when I was two for my dad's work. And we lived there until I was four. So Alaska is the first place I skied, which is really cool. And um, also my first memories are of Alaska, seeing moose in the yard and all sorts of really cool stuff. But unfortunately, Butch didn't get to come with us back to Seattle. He stayed in Alaska because he was not a very well-behaved dog, even though he was really sweet. <laughs> we moved back to Seattle when I was four, and my parents were on the volunteer ski patrol at Crystal Mountain um, because they love skiing, and they wanted an affordable way to do it um, for us as a family. Since they volunteered, they got free passes for all of us, and back then anyone could camp for free in the parking lot. So uh, when I was little, we acquired this gorgeous vehicle. Uh, it's a 1954 GMC bookmobile. And uh, my parents' friend, who is also on the ski patrol, had converted it to sleep eight. And so basically, my parents started the van life trend, I feel like, with this thing, um, except for that it was really treacherous to drive and pretty heinous looking. Um, <laughs> here's a full view, just so you can appreciate it. Um, when I was 12, 13, 14, I could not imagine anything more embarrassing than being seen by my school friends in this behemoth. Um, so it was super embarrassing for a little while, but of course, looking back now, I see what an incredible privilege and a gift it was to spend every weekend um, skiing right at the mountain and then be able to play in the snow behind there until bedtime and have such great family time um, all together. I started ski racing when I was 12, which is pretty late compared to all the rest of the kids. So I was definitely behind all my peers, um, but I grew up doing lots of sports and I loved any um, sport, anything athletic. So I love the competitive aspect of ski racing. And there was always a chance that every run I could do a little bit better. Um, mainly I liked hanging out with my friends, um, singing songs on the chairlift and being silly. Um, I went to Whitman College uh, in Walla Walla, Washington after um, high school. And there my skiing really improved. I was skiing five days a week instead of two. And I was doing dryland training, spending time in the gym and everything sort of um, clicked for me with skiing. Um, but more importantly, during college, I began to love free skiing. My friend Shauna, who I grew up racing with at Crystal, she was always the best natural skier on the mountain, and she came to Whitman as well, um, as did my, other, my younger brother, Arnie, um, and they both really loved free skiing. Everyone else would go into the lodge after races, but Arnie and Shauna always just wanted to ski into the last chair, go ski pow, hit jumps, um, so they really helped me kind of find that love for free skiing. After college, I moved to Squaw Valley. I wanted to take a year, just one year off before getting a real job. Um, and I'd never been there, but Shauna said it was the best place to be and that it snowed the most. So I moved there sight unseen, knowing no one, and I fell in love immediately. Um, I got a job at the resort at Squaw Creek, making coffee and sandwiches at the Sweet Potatoes Deli, which meant I got a free ski pass. Um, after a couple months, I had health insurance and I could pretty much ski every day for several hours. And I skied like it was my job. <laughs> a friend convinced me um, pretty early on after a couple months of being there to enter the Kirkwood free skiing contest with her. And I never, I didn't even know what a free skiing contest was. Um, but I went with her and I placed third and that was it. It was like suddenly my daily ski bumming was no longer ski bombing. I now had a purpose and I was training for something and um, it kind of fueled my fire to keep getting better at skiing, skiing around squaw, finding all the little airs um, and just trying to get, trying to get better um, every day, every run. For, so for three years I competed on the, just the North American free skiing tour and I worked double shifts in the summer at the resort to try to pay for my travel and contests in the winter. And after a couple of years, I was doing pretty well in the contest and having fun, um, but I still kind of had that nagging feeling that like, okay, I have a college degree, maybe it's time to get serious, I should probably use my brain, um, do something. Um, so I planned that kind of like, I was going to plan a last hurrah to Chamonix um, with my boyfriend at the time, and I kind of used the last of my money. I had been competing all winter, um, so I hadn't really been working much, so I used the last of my money to book a ticket to um, Chamonix and get a place to stay and had everything kind of arranged there. Um, spoiler alert, this is a photo from Chamonix, but it actually wasn't from that trip. 
Um, I didn't end up going that time because the night before our trip, I stayed up all night looking and I couldn't find my passport. We tore two houses apart and uh, went to the airport finally and they wouldn't let me on the plane, of course. And um, my then boyfriend continued on to Chamonix without me and I went back up to Tahoe with my tail between my legs and I felt like such a failure. Like here I am, a 24 year old adult um, and I couldn't even get my act together enough um, to find my passport, like a really basic thing. So I felt like a total failure and a loser, and um, I barely had any money left. <laughs> the rest of my winter was looking like a total bust. Um, these are all kind of some ski photos that I have from my time over the last many years. But to pick up with that story, um, as I was back in Tahoe, feeling sorry for myself for being such a loser. Um, my friend convinced me to come with her to Crested Butte for the contest there, which I'd never done before. It was kind of the biggest premier contest at the time, the longest running extreme contest. And she said, my dad and I are going out there. Why don't you just come with us? Um, I figured I had nothing to lose. So I borrowed some money from a friend to pay for my expenses. Um, my employer really kindly paid for my entry fee. Um, because she was super supportive. Um, the ski shop at where I worked um, covered my entry fee as like a sponsorship. And then another friend who was going to the contest said, well, you can stay on the couch in my hotel room. So I went, slept on the couch in the hotel room during the contest, went to the contest, and I ended up winning the contest, which at the time the prize money was $6,000 for first prize. And it was the biggest prize money of any contest. And I was just like, I have it made. Like, I don't have to work for a year. <laughs> I was so psyched. And I could pay my friend back. And it also felt like it gave me a little bit of freedom to um, apply for an internship. It was an unpaid internship at Powder Magazine that summer, which I ended up getting because luckily I had met the associate editor at Powder during that same trip to Crested Butte. Um, so I got the job and I also got a job working part-time at a sweet coffee shop on the beach right in San Clemente. Um, and I was psyched because now I was still in the ski industry. I was using my brain and I had just won six grand. So I was feeling pretty good. <laughs> um, but that fall I was finishing up my internship at Powder and I got a phone call from Steve Winter at Matchstick Productions. He asked me if I wanted to film with them the following winter, which was basically like the equivalent of winning the ski bomb lottery. Um, it turned out that he and his partner, Murray Weiss, had been in the audience that day and during the contest at Crested Butte. And so they decided to give me a chance. Um, so a lot of these photos I'm flipping through are from filming with MSP over the years, as well as Sherpa Cinema and Warren Miller, um, mostly in BC and Alaska. But for a while, that kind of pivotal moment of like, what changed things for you? And I, it was definitely the losing the passport moment because that meant that I went to Crested Butte and it kind of catalyzed my ski career of becoming a professional skier. And for a long time, I thought that the Miss France trip, the missing passport was one of those stories that was about a perceived failure in the moment that turned into a catalyst for better things down the road, like one of those thought it was a bad thing at the time, but it turned out to be a really good thing. Like maybe the universe hid my passport to try to take me down the right path or something. But I think that's really missing the point. And the point to me of the story, um, looking back now, has less to do with me. And it's more about all the people along the way um, that were there to help me out and support me, starting with my parents and the bookmobile way back in the day. The fact that they put such a high priority on experiences and doing fun things and getting their kids outside over say like a fancy RV <laughs> or material possessions. Um, they enabled me to ski so much and that really gave me a great foundation. Plus the fact that they supported me um, unconditionally. And I knew always in the back of my mind that if things didn't work out for me in squat or as a skier, I always had an escape hatch. Um, and that is a pretty overlooked thing um, when you're able to pursue a dream like skiing to always have in the back of my mind that if things went wrong, they were always there. I could skulk back to them and regroup if my dreams didn't pan out. Um, and that support was such a gift and a privilege. 
Um, and it continued, of course, after that with my friend Shauna and her family who took me to so many races when I was younger, enabling me to travel and ski race. Um, she shared her love of free skiing with me. And then my ski coach in college was really supportive, was always there for me um, during rough times in college. And then, of course, to the support of the skiers and community in Squaw, which hopefully a lot of you are out there tonight. And I appreciate you so much um, But I had a boss that supported my skiing, let me take time off to compete and then helped pay my entry fee. Um, when I needed it was incredible. And then uh, a friend who would loan me money when I needed it, other friends that would take me to contests um, and so many other encouraging friends along the way. So yeah, it just, um, I'm really grateful to all that support. And yeah, of course I might've been in the right place in the right time and sure I skied my hardest, but really none of it would have been able to happen without all that support. So in the end, the story isn't really so much about me, but uh, it's about the community of skiing in general that allowed this to happen. And um, along with that is around that time, I also got a coveted spot on the North Face team, which led to many more opportunities in addition to filming. <laughs> in 2006, I got invited on this trip to Baffin Island. It was an all women's trip, which meant at the time that all the skiers were women. There's um, Kasha Rigby, Hillary Nelson, Meg Oster, and myself. Um, and the photographer, Whit Richardson, and the film crew were all men. But it didn't matter. I was so psyched to go on a ski trip. I was so psyched to go to Baffin. I had heard about Baffin Island, all the couars and the first descents, um, from a slideshow from Andrew McLean and Brad Barlidge, who had been there a few years before. And I was bursting at the seams with excitement to get to go to this amazing place with all these unskied couars. Um, and the part about the fact that we were going to make a TV show, I guess I didn't hear that part so much. Um, <laughs> I, I just let that go in one ear and out the other. I was just excited to get to Baffin and ski cores. Um, Baffin Island is located in the Arctic Circle. It's north of Quebec. And we went to the very northeast corner to a hamlet, a village there called Clyde River. Here's Hillary at the airport in Iqaluit. It's the capital of Baffin, which is the province of Nunavut, where Baffin Island is located. And uh, this is right outside the airstrip in Clyde River after we landed in the cargo plane that um, arrives once a week or so to deliver necessities to the tiny Inuit outpost there of Clyde River. And clearly the kids there are much better at playing video games than the kids down here are. <laughs> Um, but since we had the film crew, it meant we couldn't we couldn't travel light and fast, but it also meant that we had access and budget to hire the local Inuit guides, which meant we got snowmobiles um, to transport all of us and our gear. And we had the guides um, amazing knowledge of the landscape and the terrain and their protection against the wildlife, which would prove to be pretty helpful. Um, here we are loading everything up complete with the seal on the back there that you can see would be the food for the dogs who would be dog sledding along with us for part of the journey. Um, they still use dog sleds there quite often, um, but their main form of transport these days is the snow machine. And this is where we rode in the back of these wooden boxes called Comatix. The temperatures were freezing cold, like minus 30 or something. And so for the day and a half it took to get out to our first camp spot, <laughs> we basically hunkered down for the bumpy ride um, and just kind of went to your happy place. Because <laughs> um, this is the best, most efficient way to transport humans out there. Um, <clears throat> So the first night we went, well, we just went for a couple hours the first day and then we set up a temporary camp on land not far from Clyde River and it was just on the edge of the open ocean. And I walked a little ways away from my tent to go pee. Um, and when I came back, one of the guides was like, you may never walk that far away from camp again. There are polar bears here and they could be stalking us and they're waiting for that exact moment when you walk away. And so they had rifles with them the whole time and they were really clear that we needed to be on it with the bear safety. So that was another thing to add to the list. <laughs> These photos, um, all the, yeah, the professional photos here are all by Whit Richardson, who's an amazing photographer. And then a bunch of these are also Kasha Rigby's photos. Um, once we got away from the land and out towards the fjords, away from the open ocean, um, the scenery got much better. It was amazing. All these, um, where the ice comes together and is pushed up, there's all these really cool stacks of ice that are pretty bumpy to go over in the Comatic. We'd often just get out and <laughs> climb over them, but um, the landscape just got incredibly beautiful. The sun never sets 
when we were there during April. Um, so it was like the magic hour for many hours every day. And here's our first camp spot in the Gibbs Fjord. I can't exactly explain to you how cold it was during the first few weeks of the trip, at least. It was freezing. Um, it was basically your all-consuming thought all the time, every day. It was, how do I stay warm? What's my next move like? How do I not get cold? Um, and this is crazy how cold it is. Um, it was always about trying to keep your toothpaste, your sunscreen from freezing, um, and then how to stay warm enough to be able to sleep when you're also sleeping next to your frozen brick of toothpaste and sunscreen and your frozen boot liners. Um, and it was definitely, um, I remember one morning uh, inside our tent, the sun was out, we we're waking up at like 11 a.m. And it was the, like the warmest it was. It's kind of like, oh, it's warm. And the thermometer said minus nine. And that was like when it was warm. Um, <laughs> but luckily, Kasha, we had Kasha and Hillary with us. And they were so experienced and calm and so knowledgeable about how to stay um, sane and successful on an expedition. And uh, Hillary's trick was just to eat butter. She put butter on everything because it gives you energy. And you can it goes on almost every anything so she always had tons of energy from eating butter and then um kasha was always the nurturing one looking out for everyone's physical and mental well-being make sure everyone's doing okay here she is pouring us more tea and then you can see hillary's pouring over some maps she's always a tactician um, doing the planning and the plotting for success and she's excellent with logistics and organization not to mention she is the strongest person i've ever been in the mountains with um so i learned so much from both of them and it was incredible to with all their experience um, that they shared with us um, from all their trips. They'd been to remote and high places skiing all over the world. And then at one point, um, one of the guy's wives came out to visit for a few nights at our camp and they brought their one-year-old baby, <laughs> who of course never made a peep the whole time, was perfectly happy, never cried, um, and not cold at all. So that shut us up pretty quickly with our whimpering about the cold and we no longer complained about the trip. We needed to buck up if that baby wasn't complaining. <laughs> um, but being able to spend time with the Inuit people was one of the most fascinating and rewarding parts of this trip. Uh, we learned a lot about their history and it was the first time that I had heard stories from people who were directly affected um, from their way of life through government actions that had been done um, generations before, um, moving them from their nomadic way of life, traveling throughout the winter, staying on the ice, and then moving to land in the summer, and being able to hunt and follow the wildlife on a yearly cycle. And then when the government came in and forced them, much the same as in the U.S., um, onto reserves there, um, it just really changed their way of life and took away a lot of traditions and a lot of purpose. And um, just hearing their stories was pretty powerful. Um, and but the people that we spent time with in Clyde River, at least, um, the tribe there had chosen to become a dry community. Um, and the people that we spent time with there were incredibly optimistic and they were really intent on preserving the traditions and ways of life that had been handed down to them through generations. And they wanted to preserve whatever they could um, of that because it's just who they are. Um, this, such a special man. This was our guide, Ilko, who at the time was 60 years old. Um, he was a climate advocate who traveled around the world addressing um, different conferences and making speeches about his experience seeing climate change with his own eyes um, and how it affected his daily life. He, For him, food from the grocery store, yeah, he could buy it, but it wasn't real food to him. Real food was what he could hunt or gather from the land and sea. And uh, since the yearly temperatures had increased considerably over his 60 years. Um, he'd seen, you know, season, seasonally later ice formation in the fjords, um, earlier seasonal melting, um, more snow. It's usually a really cold, dry place in the Arctic, and more snow just impeded um, the movement of the wildlife and interrupted the natural cycle of life. So it was also the first time, you know, this is 15 years ago, but this is the first time that I had heard firsthand about someone where climate change was actually affecting their life in a real measurable way. So that was really eye-opening as well. And here you can see he was born in an igloo um, in the very spot that we had our second base camp on the ice and hunting is a really critical part of 
his way of life to feed and clothe himself and his family. Um, so after the long, dark winter, they spend a ton of time indoors um, when it's really dark in the winter. And then as soon as it starts getting light, April, it was like he had so much energy and we'd go up skiing up a couloir and he'd be down on the ice um, with a hole in the ice fishing for Arctic char or hunting for seal. And then at night we'd go to sleep and he'd take off um, to go hunt caribou and fox um, and he just had a ton of energy and was really excited to share with us um, the food that he caught and prepared and then also just telling us stories about his way of life. Definitely one of the best parts of that trip. Um, so this is the first Kuar we skied. Um, if I go back up here, you can see um, at the very end of the wall behind that white pointy tent, you can see the Kuar. But um, so we could see it from camp. And it looked, oh, it's pretty close. But then we started skinning. And <laughs> two hours later, we finally made it to the core. The landscape there is so huge that you were kind of skinning towards it and it never got any closer. But finally, we got there and the snow was firm, edgeable, chalky. It made for super great climbing. You could just run up that thing. Um, and then it was really fun, edgeable skiing on the way down. But the best part was the view from the top looking out over all the fjords and just kind of realizing um, the potential here for skiing is incredible. Everywhere we looked, um, further down the fjord in every direction, there's more walls, more cores. Um, and after we skied the first one, the director of the film crew was kind of like, uh, okay, so you guys are just planning and doing that over and over again, but it looks the same. Like, it's the same thing, isn't it? And we were like, oh, no, it's not. And, yes, that's what we plan to do. And he was like, well, how am I going to make a TV show? <laughs> we're like, I don't know. That's your job. We're here to ski, and we're going to ski as many cores as possible. And so I think he was kind of like, oh, boy. Um, he was a super nice guy. He was from New Jersey made a regular TV show about the New York Mets and he'd been skiing a couple times with Vail, uh, in Vail with his family and he was just like blown away by where we were and couldn't believe um, what we we're trying to do but also then had to make a TV show about it. So he kind of tried to create like a reality show with maybe there'll be some drama but there wasn't any drama we just wanted to ski so <laughs> that was kind of a funny dynamic on the trip but we made some compromises the film crew was great they hustled to make it happen so we could ski and also make a tv show um and i think we all we all made out pretty well on the trip i'd say no one can complain about this trip um <laughs> except for the kiting part which did not work out so well we brought kites because that's how andrew mclean and brad barlage had traveled around on their previous trip and some of us had managed to practice a bit before we left but um when we got there to the fjords we either had no wind or way too much wind for the huge kites that we brought so we had a couple of really terrifying experiences of like okay so kasha and i are going to group up um, we're going to be a team and okay kasha you have the rifle on your back in case we see a polar bear and we're gonna we're gonna kite this way and see if we see any cores and we took off and instantly it was like she's gone i'm gone i'm like zooming all by myself down this fjord with a way overpowered kite that i can't even stop <laughs> and i was like definitely going to get eaten by a polar bear and it was really scary <laughs> so we, we pretty much realized that the kiting wasn't going to happen um for our own safety and the guides were super relieved about that too um so we tried kiting a couple times but yeah we decided we should probably stick to skinning um, and the occasional snowmobile ride, of course, too. Um, skinning was also a great way to stay warm. Just moving around in general, you kind of had to to stay warm. So we were happy to do it all day. And there was plenty of daylight. And for me, I found that when I was in a place like this, I just had so much energy. Maybe it was all the butter that Hillary was making me eat. But I just, it was like everywhere I looked, there was kawars, there was daylight. And I was just psyched to ski. So we started ticking off kawars. Um, we ended up skiing 19 different Kuars in 21 days of camping on the ice, um, probably nine of which were first descents, we think. Um, and it was incredible. Here's Kasha looking fantastic and leading the charge up the Kuar. And then you can see there, there were some windy ones, there were straight ones, um, <laughs> every type of Kuar. And after a few days of good weather, we got a little bit of snow which of course meant that much more from all the walls gathered in the couloirs and it made for some excellent kind of boot top powder skiing, as you can see right there. 
Um, it was stable the whole time we were there. We never had to worry about any avalanches. Um, and this is skiing down a Kawar probably at 10 p.m. with that beautiful sunset light. Um, and it was just every Kawar was like winding up through the spires and the walls for thousands of feet. This is probably our best ski, though. This is a 5,000-foot shoot with no bottom. Um, the peak was probably about 6,000 feet, and the core itself maybe five. Um, but the peak was so big, it was one of the largest ones around. It made its own weather. So we started out down here on the ice, and we made our way up this apron and then across this traverse um, here into the chute itself. Um, but you had to be careful because the bottom of the chute just rolled over into nothingness. So Hillary's solution was she set up a rope across the bottom, kind of like an oh crap rope, <laughs> so that you knew if you're skiing down, just kind of like woohoo, that if you saw the rope, you needed to stop. And if for some reason you were falling down the couloir and you had the wherewithal to reach up and grab the rope, that was an option too. But basically you didn't want to go past the rope. Um, and so here we are coming up the apron and you can see in the background, kind of underneath this pointy little tooth thing way back at the toe of that glacier, that's where we camped for the second half of the trip in the Sam Ford Fjord. But here we are uh, ascending the apron and then we had to make the traverse across and then we were in the Kawar. And here we are getting higher up. You can see the weather was pretty gnarly. It was snowing and blowing with a lot of spin drift coming down. Um, but we knew we were almost to the top and Hillary was super confident and really determined leader. And she was like, you guys, we got this, like, just keep going. Um, so we had to go over this last little bit here. This is Witt's super cool photo of getting over the crux to the top. And then we just had, it was blowing so hard at the top. We switched over as quick as we could and rappelled down over this little spot. And then it was pretty much gravy all the way back down into the sun. It was such an incredible ski, 5,000 foot, amazing couloir, really steep at the top. And then it kind of opened up into this just perfect GS turns and then you just had to make sure that you uh, took a left at the bottom when you saw the rope. <laughs> Don't go past the rope. And then after 21 days on the ice, um, our trip was over and it was time to head back. The ice is starting to kind of melt. You'd walk around and you'd feel the creeks underneath you, which is kind of spooky. Um, and it was definitely time you'd start to see little um, cracks open up between the um, plates of ice and yeah it was time to go back to Clyde River and start the journey home um but on the way we got to see these amazing polar bears that just happened to be cruising by when we were on our way back so that was a pretty magical part of the journey um and then we also spent some time in a Callowit at a women's shelter there which was another really powerful part of the trip and we did some projects there and spent a day with the women in a Callowit and just um, sort of listen to their stories and uh, another really amazing way to be able to hear from that community and um, just, I guess, share stories, hear stories from another part of the world. Um, and then <laughs> fast forward almost 10 years to 2015. Um, and this is another trip that I went on. I did a lot of trips in between. But this was one of the crazier trips I've been on for other reasons, just culturally. And um, also, I was at a different time in my career. I'd gotten married a few months before to Jim, lucky Jim. <laughs> um, but then a couple months after we got married, I was like, OK, um, see ya. Uh, I'm taking off for a crazy winter. And I think at the time, it was just what I was compelled to do. It was what I'd always done. I'd always said yes to everything. Um, I felt that I had this dream career, but at any moment it could kind of go away. So I needed to say yes and take advantage of every opportunity um, because that was the way that I was going to keep clinging to being able to be a skier for my job. Um, but so this winter I took two trips to BC, one of which Jim got to come on, which was amazing. Um, and then I left in February for a week in Lofoten, Norway. Um, and then next up was flying to Vladivostok, which is pictured here. Um, and it's on the very eastern part of Russia. But I was with a crew of two other skiers on the North Face team, Nick Martini and Callum Pettit. Um, there's filmers Leo Horn and Mason Mashon from Sherpa Cinema and um, photographer Kari Medic and John Clary Davies from Powder Magazine. Um, and that was our amazing crew. And then we had two Russian um, kind of fixers, interpreters, um, logistic magicians their names were Alex and Andre 
Um, but yeah, Vladivostok, you can see it's way in the eastern, kind of southeastern part of Siberia, way down there. It's a bustling city of about half a million people, which is really crazy. Um, and there's absolutely no skiing anywhere nearby. So you're probably asking, what the heck was I doing there? And I was definitely asking that myself, like, why are we here? There's no skiing nearby. Is there even any skiing in Siberia? It was really hard to get information on it, um, but our plan was to take the Great Siberian Railway from east to west, all the way across Russia, um, from Vladivostok to Moscow, and to stop to ski along the way. Um, and at some point we were hoping to search, to be able to find a village where there was a rumor of some of the remaining original skiers who still use skis that they make themselves um, as a means of transportation and they've used them to hunt for centuries. Um, but I personally was super nervous about the continental snowpack in Siberia, and of course the fact that we didn't have any ski guides or really any beta on the skiing whatsoever. I had managed to talk to a Russian guide before the trip that Jim knew, um, and he was like, well, yeah, there's some good skiing, but you need to be there in December, because otherwise it's either rainy or avalanche or both. Like, you don't want to go there in March, which of course we were going there in <laughs> February into March. Um, so I didn't know what to expect, but luckily um, the culture and the culture shock was just too distracting for me to worry about any of that because we were about to get on the Great Siberian Railway. And my mind was blown. Um, first, we had three days on the train. Uh, this is what my living area looked like for those three days. Um, at least half of it was mine anyways, and the other half was either shared with a pile of luggage or another female passenger who might get on at any time. And over the course of the entire trip, I mostly had them to myself, but two different times I had, uh, I shared my berth with another passenger, a female and um, two different strangers. And it was definitely a little weird to be sleeping that close to a stranger that I didn't know, but also it was pretty cool because um, they ended up being really interesting, nice human beings. And we got to chat and they told crazy stories about living in Siberia. Um, so that was really interesting. Um, but here I am in my bunk, all psyched, getting on the train. <laughs> and we stayed in the first class cabin, which we mostly had to ourselves. Um, it's just too expensive for the average Russian to stay in the first class cabin. Um, and so at a few different points, we'd wander back to the other cabins in the train. Um, and they're definitely way more packed with people close together, um, no beds for people to sleep on. And at one point there was a man who had boarded the train and he was walking up and down the different compartments selling um, fresh deer parts out of his backpack. So there's just like hooves and different things sticking out of his backpack and people could just, I guess, purchase um, a part of a deer that they wanted from his backpack. Um, but we didn't buy any deer. Um, here's the stack of ski bags <laughs> that I often share my cabin with because we just had way too much gear to fit in the luggage storage spots. Um, so these were like super sketchily rigged to these flimsy luggage racks um, and they would sway around and lurch as the train went back and forth and around corners and I definitely thought I was going to get squished at night by the stack of ski bags. Um, lucky for me they held. One of them toppled one time and I thought it was going to crash down but the the straps held. Way to go, ski bags. Uh, this was the dining car. It was, again, way too expensive for most passengers. So we had it mostly to ourselves. Um, and we ate three meals a day there. We worked out a deal with the railway. It's where we could get three meals a day for a decent price. And the food was actually really good. The chef made fresh bread for us, lots of salads, lots of cabbage, cucumber, tomato salads, which I love, with lots of vinegar and lots of really good soup, um, potatoes, fish, and then lots of fresh herbs on everything. So it was actually pretty good. I kind of loved it. Um, this was Evgeny. <laughs> he was one of the conductors in our compartment and he definitely kept in line, kept us in line. He looks intimidating, but he was pretty much a teddy bear. Um, but, and he just wanted to make sure we didn't actually miss the train at every stop, especially Kari, who's the photographer in the background there, um, because he would get so absorbed in taking photos that he would just wander off. He'd totally lose track of where he was and what time it was. And he nearly missed the train several times, which you would not have been wanted to get stranded out there in Siberia. The next train wouldn't have come for days. Believe me, you just didn't want to get, you wanted, you needed to make it on the train. Um, we figured out pretty quickly that there is a schedule. So we knew when the stops were coming up. And if you didn't get off at each stop, you were missing out because it, it, it turned into a game of at each stop, you have between two to maybe 30 minutes 
to get as far as you could away from the train or kind of see what tasty snacks you could find in a vending machine or if you're a me, probably find a set of stairs to run up and down a couple times just to try to get some exercise. <laughs> and then you had to make it back on the train in time before the train left. And there wasn't like a horn or anything. It was just like you needed to know how much time you had and then you needed to get back on. Um, and I also, of course, instituted a daily exercise practice on the train where I led everyone in some calisthenics. <laughs> Which this is Evgeny's wife, Evgenia, and she <laughs> was our other conductor in our compartment. And she thought we were so funny, especially the exercises. She just thought everything else, everything we did was funny. Um, she, but she took such great care of us. She gave us candies and chocolates and she made sure she was like, Hey, shower. And asked me if I needed a shower. And I was like, where's the shower? Cause there wasn't a shower. And she took me to the private engineer's compartment and made sure that she guarded the door for me so I could take a hot shower. She was really kind. Um, and we'd be rolling along in the train for a day or two, looking at absolutely nothing out the window, just complete flat snow, maybe some trees. And then all of a sudden you'd pull up to this bustling town of 600,000 people and just people going about their daily lives in what to me felt like the middle of nowhere, but this is like their center of their universe. So it was really, um, really expanded my mind. Uh, this was a pretty regular scene. Our fixer, this is Alex, one of our Russian brothers. Um, his brother's name was Andre, and they were our lifelines in Russia. I definitely don't recommend going to Siberia without them. <laughs> we talked to some other um, Westerners who were taking the, Grand, the Great Siberian Railway to travel, and they were like, how are you guys surviving and figuring anything out? And we we're like, oh, Alex and Andre. They got it handled. Andre was a great skier, and Alex spoke excellent English and was the logistics master. Um, so pretty regularly, of course, we had the cameras and the ski gear, so the Russian authorities would show up, the policemen, and Alex would just do some smooth talking, show some papers, there'd be some handshakes and some waves, and then we'd go on our way. This was our chef on the train, a really funny guy that made great bread. Um, and finally, after three days of our safe little train bubble, we were so comfortable and so happy on the train. Um, it was time to get off the tracks and go skiing, which we did not know what to expect. There's um, another train employee there. We loved her. She was one of our favorite train workers. And there, there's our whole crew. So we got off at a place called Gorem Amai. It is a ski resort near the shore of Lake Baikal, which is the largest lake in the world. And when we got off the train, I mean, it's just impossible to imagine any skiing nearby. This is what it looked like. There's a frozen lake with someone driving on it. It's a popular wintertime activity in Siberia. <laughs> um, we got off the train probably at 3 a.m. and piled into a van with all our gear and drove several hours to the ski area. That's a scene that we saw on our way. Um, and this is what the ski area looked like, which I mean, yeah, it's skiing, it's really fun, um, but not maybe what I would have flown halfway around the world and taken a th train three days to go to. <laughs> so we were a little still not sure if we we're going to find any good skiing, but we went to the top of the mountain and you could see more mountains from there. And after an hour drive and a 10 kilometer snowmobile ride, we finally arrived here which was up in the mountains at Gormamai, and this is our home for the week, our own little backcountry paradise in the middle of the secret, clandestine, underground, Siberian backcountry shred mecca. Um, the owner of the cabin, well, no one really owns the cabin. They build them on land that doesn't belong to anyone, and I, somehow it's sort of overlooked um, with the legality of it. But there's a bunch of people that go up here and... They don't have a ton of backcountry experience or knowledge, but they definitely make up for it in enthusiasm. And it was really super wild tapping into this kind of underground Siberian ski culture. Here's the inside of the hut. It was a super cool structure with a wood-fired stove and a sleeping loft. You can kind of see the bottom of it. Um, and then we met our guide. This was our local guide, um, Avalanche Man. And he was called that because he'd been in six avalanches, one of which he dug himself out with his bare hands. Um, and he, so he was going to be our guide for the week. And he was quite the character. He definitely laughed at our beacon drills. He had an analog beacon and didn't really even know how to use it. And when I asked him through one of our interpreters, I was asking about the snowpack. He looked straight at me and was like, no avalanche now. And I was like, what do you mean? Like, there's the snowpack's really sugary and like the... It gets 10 feet of 
snowpack and he explained well it hasn't snowed in a month and there would be no avalanches and I kind of pushed him and he just kind of like shook his head and like no there's not gonna be any avalanches like I don't know what else to tell you no avalanches lady <laughs> but um oh and he also had he, this is his technique um i don't hopefully you can read those words so this is his technique if you do encounter a bear in the wild you need to have a knife but if the bear is about to attack you you take the knife in one hand sacrifice your other hand by putting it into the bear's mouth and at the same time stab the bear in the heart it's a good tip if you ever find yourself you'll lose one hand but you won't get eaten entirely um, but that was Avalanche Man. So the train actually looked really great. And despite his certainty about the conditions, we played it super safe. Um, here we are skinning up a ridge on our first evening. Um, and you can see the look on my face. I'm definitely encouraged by the amazing terrain that's there. And the feel of the snow feels like powder. Um, I'm definitely also scared crapless about the prospects for our safety way out here in the middle of the nowhere. I was definitely one of the more experienced people on the trip, and I took that responsibility really seriously. I was like, no one can get injured on my watch. Um, and I felt really proud that at the end of the trip, we didn't have any major injuries, maybe a minor one, um, but we didn't set off any avalanches except for Avalanche Man himself who did set off one wet slide <laughs> at the end of the trip, but he called it. He said, this is going to avalanche. And then he skied right into it and it had warmed up and it was an obvious wet slide, but that was on him. That was all avalanche, man. <laughs> it wasn't on me. <laughs> and the terrain was amazing. Um, There's really fun shoots and ribs. You can see um, looking across at that ridge as the snow is super soft and sugary. It was the kind of snow that's so slow. They almost get bogged down when you're skiing. It's like slow motion skiing because the crystals are so angular and it's so deep with no layers in it. So it's a really crazy feeling, but it was really fun skiing. And we just couldn't believe that not only did we find skiing, but we found good terrain and good snow. And as we eased our way more and more into the train, it was kind of feeling a bit more like Avalanche Man might be right, but we, we still weren't going to trust him completely. Um, just coming in with our Western mindsets, and he, he had very much more the experience mindset, and I have more like the education, knowledge, the dig the pits, the this and that. And uh, yeah, two different ways. <laughs> Here's... um. Yeah, more skiing. Um, so we're kind of easing our way in. And then the second day of skiing, we were there. Nick Martini went off an air and dislocated his shoulder. Um, we were able to put it back in, but then he was kind of interested in seeing a, his options for getting home. So he busted out the sat phone, tried to use that. It didn't work. Um, and even after spending an hour on the phone with the sat phone company, they were like, well, you needed to have all these papers. And we're like, we did the papers. I don't know what happened. Sat phone didn't work. Um, the Russian brothers had cell service on their cell phones, but you needed to hike an hour up to the top of the ridge to get it. So that was like, we are so remote and we are our only option for rescue here if anything goes wrong. But Nick um, was like, well, my shoulder feels better. I'm not going to leave after all. I'll just stay and hang out and maybe in a couple of weeks it'll feel better and I'll get to ski at the end of the trip. So then the following day, Callum and I go out skiing. And after a full day skiing and filming, kind of working our way into a little bit bigger terrain, we got back to the hut in the evening. We're just taking our boots back, taking our boots off. And the call came over the radio that a woman had broken her leg and they needed our help with the rescue. So we um, towed up behind the sled, up the snowmobile road quite a ways. And we got to this slope and she, this isn't a picture of the rescue. This is just when we were skiing. But way at the top of this kind of shoot between these trees is where she was. And it uh, happened at the very top of the slope, basically. And she had a broken leg. So we had a plastic gear sled that we hiked up to her. The two Russian guys she was with wanted to strap her broken leg to the gear sled, which we didn't think was a good idea. So we managed to talk them into letting us splint the leg um, in a better way. And we got her down safely. And then they were like, okay, we're just going to hitch her back to hitch her to the back of the snowmobile in the sled and drag her down the road. And we insisted that they at least have someone ski behind with a rope to keep the sled from falling off, but they wouldn't do it. And they said, we got this. And they took off down the road. So we went back to the hut and we're hanging out, taking our boots off again, about to eat dinner. And suddenly the call came on the radio again that, oh, they dumped her in the creek. And sure enough, going back down. <laughs> Yeah, going back down the sled road, there was a narrow bridge that was maybe 10 feet up the creek, and 
her sled had fallen, slipped off, and pulled the whole snowmobile sideways. So she was sitting in the creek, and the snowmobile was on the bank. Um, so we skied as fast as we could down the snowmobile track, helped get her out, had a bunch of sleeping bags, dried her off, and then finally we were able to convince them to just hold her on the back of the super long sled um, with someone propping her up. Um, so they took her out that way. And we heard later from her on Facebook that she was healing great and everything went well. Um, so that was good. But yeah, just another reminder that we needed to we needed to keep it dialed. But we did get into some of those awesome lines across the way and got into some bigger lines. And Avalanche Man was right. We never set off an avalanche um, and we're able to ski some amazing terrain and also meet some awesome people like Julia here. Um, she showed up at the top of one of the ridges when John was hanging out waiting for people to set up and she showed up and she just announced like, hey, I'm Julia, I'm lost, but I have alcohol. And she screwed the top off of her ski pole and <laughs> proceeded to pour shots for everyone and then explained that she didn't really know how to ski but she was with her friends. They went a different way. She ended up following the boot pack, like an hour boot pack of a pretty steep ridge. And uh, they had to, they ended up um, helping her ski back down because she was kind of a beginner skier. But that was another funny experience from Gorama Mai. Um, and then it was back on the train, back to our next stop. This time it was only for a day and a half on the train. It went pretty quickly. Um, and then we got off in Sharagesh, which is right smack in the middle of Siberian. And it's um, actually a destination ski area for people in Siberia. It also had the coolest train station that I've ever seen. Um, but we arrived during a huge storm. This is where we thought we had to be there in kind of December or January to get the good snow, but we arrived when it was just dumping. We found this awesome taxi driver with his sweet van to take us up to the mountain. Um, this is what it looked like <laughs> in our van. And we got to the mountain and it was definitely the most confusing scene I've ever encountered. Each lift is owned by a different owner and takes you a couple of hundred feet up the mountain. But then to get to the next lift, you have to buy a different ticket and they're each like $2, but still it was like, where's the good terrain? All these lifts are so confusing. Nothing goes anywhere. <sighs> and we had the total powder panic of when it's really good and you're just blowing it. Um, but then luckily I spotted some guys that looked like they were free riders and I just walked right up to them and started chatting with them and they became our best friends and they showed us all around. Sharagash, they had us to their houses, they fed us food, they took us to all the powder stashes, and I still keep in touch with them. Um, some of them follow on Instagram and stuff, they took great care of us. And again, it's just, you know, it's all about the people that we met and connected with and um, how amazing they were above and beyond the skiing. And the skiing was definitely amazing. It dumped several feet our first few days there, and there are tons of kind of mellow, hikeable, Japan style, like just short pitches of really sweet terrain in and out of the resort. Um, more pow. Here's a pillow zone. Cal sending it over some pillows. Um, and then the last part of the trip was a little sad just because we had to split up. Um, we, the whole time we were in Russia, we were trying to find out more information about the um, native Russian skiers, the original skiers. And finally, we found out where they were, and there was a chance to go visit, um, but only one skier got to go from the team because um, there was only one helicopter load that could get in, and it was super expensive and remote. Um, but so Callum got to go because his feet were really hurting, and he couldn't be in his ski boots anyways. So if he went there, he didn't have to ski. Um, so he got to go, but I'm super happy that they went because it's just an incredible story. And they got to meet this guy, Vitaly, who's a seventh generation hunter and ski maker. And he makes his own wooden skis with uh, horsehair bottoms. And he could go anywhere. He could just run up these slopes. And then, of course, he just shreds on the way down. He was hitting pillows. And it was really funny to watch the videos of him skiing and his son skiing versus Callum. Even though Callum was pretty good. He's a good athlete. Um, but, yeah, meanwhile, the rest of us were back at Shiragesh skiing powder, hanging out with our friends, eating lots of pancakes. And, uh yeah, skiing, powder, and we found some amazing zones off the volcano there. Um, and then it was time to get back on the train and go to Moscow and just be tourists. At this point, we really enjoyed our last ride on the train. We kind of embraced, um, as you can see, I'm embracing the Siberian railway hipster vibe there, <laughs> really getting into it. And then finally we got to Moscow. So we crossed almost the entire country of Russia back to Moscow. And then we just got to be tourists for a little bit 
Um, we got to see a Russian ballet. And then from there, I went to Verbier for a week because it was just that type of a winter. Um, and then it was wonderful, but it was also a total culture shock. And by that point, I just wanted to get home and see Jim. Um, and there he is. Yay, there you are. Um, this is inside his 1983 Toyota Dolphin. He was living in it when I first met him. So apparently I have a thing for, um, you know, converted old bands. The bookmobile thing really stuck with me. <laughs> um, there's the outside view of the Dolphin. We no longer have it, but it was pretty great. Um, and I got back in time for a little spring skiing in Washington, which this is what it looks like. This is spring skiing in Washington, but there's actually some amazing skiing. This is in the North Cascades. Um, and then shortly after that, we were pregnant with our first daughter. So um, I definitely think that spending that crazy winter and crossing Siberia was really one of those times. It was like, all right, this is great. You've done this for a long time. You've done amazing trips. It's still really fun, um, but it's time to move into a different phase. And I no longer need to take a train across Siberia. Um, if we want to have a family, it's time to start. So luckily, uh, yeah, we. this is me skiing pregnant in Chile at about three months pregnant. I didn't tell anyone. I was down there coaching a camp. I didn't tell anyone that I was pregnant just because I wasn't sure how it was going to be. It's really... Um, a strange thing to think about being an athlete that in such a physical sport as skiing and then that your body was going to be now um, making another human and I just wanted to also ski as much as possible um, but not try to have anything to prove so try to really walk that line of um, listening to myself and what was right for me and I definitely have made some mistakes along the way um, but for the most part, especially that first pregnancy, I was able to ski um, right up until 10 days before we had Betty and skied a lot of nice powder. Here I am at like nine months pregnant. You can see I can barely bend over. <laughs> um, and yeah, then in um, 2016 in March, um, Betty was born. She's almost five now. Um, she's, yeah, she'll be five in March, which is crazy. Um, but, and it's been definitely the best adventure of all of them and it kind of feels like all of the other trips all everything that I've done was a preparation for this um, the greatest adventure and yeah a lot of juggling um, but again having amazing support um, here's Betty on her first powder day at Revelstoke her first powder day was at Revelstoke I mean kids these days come on um, but yeah, all the support, again, it takes an entire village and it takes the support of Jim, my parents, his parents, our entire community. Um, and you kind of think like, oh, we'll just be able to bring the kid along with us. We'll sleep in the lodge. This is the only time Betty ever napped in a lodge. We have it on, we have it on photo. So I just want to say that this is the only time you can see Jim's like, holy cow, she's sleeping in the lodge. So it's not definitely what you think. And um, a lot more sleepless nights, a lot more juggling, a lot of like nursing in crazy places, pumping milk, crazy places, rushing to get out the door. Um, who's going to watch the kid? But um, for us, for right now, it's the right thing to do. And now we have another um, daughter, Clover, who's two. And this is kind of my first heir, the the next winter after having a kid and it just felt really great to be able to okay I can still do what I love to do and um hit airs and ski powder and I love skiing just as much as I ever did so that didn't change which I was I think I was kind of nervous about it before having kids um so I still love to ski and do this and you know go to Whistler and go sled skiing in the backcountry just as much as I ever did but now um, it's more important to me to balance um, my safety and risk tolerance and make sure that I'm making decisions with regards to the entire family and not just me anymore. Um, and before it was much more selfish but global and now I feel like it's much more family and community and definitely in a more local place if that makes sense. Um, it's all about um, exploring Washington and the amazing mountains here and skiing with my family. Um, and then reflecting on all that support and all the um, amazing foundation that I was given and how can I extend that to more people who might not have that opportunity. So looking beyond just myself and out into the community 
um, and figuring out how we can expand access to more people and give more people just the option of doing this and having these opportunities. And at the end of the day, it's all about um, skiing with family and community. Here I am skiing with my mom at Stevens Pass. And then here's our daughter, Betty, at the local ski hill, um, ripping up the rope toe. Um, and at the end of the day, for me these days, this is <laughs> um, as good as any ski trip um, that I could go on. So I feel really fortunate um, for the entire journey. And now that it brings it full circle back in Washington with Jim and my family um, is just the best thing. And I couldn't ask for more. Um, but I just want to thank everyone for coming out. And I'll stick around and do questions. So you can ask me anything. And I really appreciate everyone for being here. Thanks so much. Oh, gosh, what an awesome show, Ingrid. So rad. Um, gosh, such a such a fun time. Um, let me uh, pipe you in here so we can make sure we're on the same page. Um, and I think we'll be good to go here. All right. Cool. Thank you, Ingrid. Thanks, Brendan. Thanks so much for having me. And thanks, everyone who tuned in. Tuned in. Yeah, and, I, and before we get into the questions, I'd like to thank everybody. It sounds like there was another thousand dollars made directly um, to the Tahoe Fund um, through the through the direct portal there. So thank you for everyone who was filled with the fever. Um, but we have some great questions, um, which is always the case here with such an awesome audience. Uh, the first is from Chris and Sage, and they asked, "Did you ever find that passport?" <laughs> that's funny um a friend just texted me that too um yes i found the passport like months later it was uh it was in kip's drawer at his house somewhere like buried yeah we could blame kip he, he, he wasn't trying to sandbag you though <laughs> that's a possibility i hadn't considered but <laughs> thanks brendan <laughs> Yeah. Oh, we miss Kip. Um, yeah. The next next question, uh, Douglas DeVore, is there a way we can see the TV show that they shot of the trip? I'm reluctant to admit this, but when I was looking back for some stuff about the trip, I did find it online. Um, and it's like really long, way too long. Um, but yeah, it's uh, Baffin Island. I forget what they named it. It's some cheesy name. But you can see it on the um it's like mountain film website from 2007 or something I, i'd have to come up with a link um but i just googled baffin island 2006 and then our names and it came up yeah very cool um the next question is from stella uh what suggestions do you have for someone trying to break into backcountry skiing oh um well, definitely get educated as much as possible. Um, take a class, learn whatever you can, and then find good mentors. And even if that means hiring some guides, that's one of the best ways to go out and learn a local place. Um, if you know, if you want to go out in Tahoe or Washington, hire some local guides and go out with them. And you can pepper them with questions the whole time. Um, they're paid to listen to your questions <laughs> and also show you around. So it's a really great um, wealth of knowledge there. Um, and just if you're going out with people, make sure that they also have a similar level of experience and knowledge to you. And also they're willing to listen to you and that they, they, they're people that you'd trust your life to. So yeah, partners, education, equipment, learning how to use it. And then um, yeah, guides can be a great component of the education piece. Yeah, we always tell beginners in the shop that, you know, the money that you spend on guides, which, um, you know, they're doing a very honorable role in the world, you'll learn more in one or two or three days from those folks that you will in years with your bros. So uh, we definitely encourage it. Um, okay, next up is David Nicholas. Um, David's like a brain surgeon or something, uh, lives in South Shore, I think, or a rocket scientist, one of the two. He says, 
have I watched many of I have watched many of these presentations and I'm always taken aback by how humble professional athletes like you have to be. Do you ever think that you should have taken up basketball or another sport where you get to live lavishly instead of not having a shower for weeks at a time? No way. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I like basketball, but I wasn't, I mean, I played basketball. I wasn't that good at it. Um, but yeah, no, I don't mind not taking a shower if it means I get to do, do cool things, you know? <laughs> yeah. The most I'll, sleep at, I'll sleep in a tent and not take a shower if it means I get to ski all those cool hours. Yeah, and if you don't shower for like a really long time, you know, three weeks or more, then your body just starts self-cleaning. So it's a moot point anyway, right? <laughs> That's a myth, but yeah. <laughs> okay, we'll we'll next... just continue to believe it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think, I think it works. Um, <laughs> next up is from Amy Berry, uh, a rock star from the Tahoe Fund. She says, thanks so much for sharing your stories. Uh, and can you talk about what it is like to raise your kids and how you get them out on the snow? Oh, um, yeah. I, we just try to spend as much time outside as possible with them doing whatever and try not to force it. I think the funny thing was when we first started our oldest daughter on skis, I was very much like, well, we have to teach her to do it right. And she has to do this and like lean forward and bend your knees. And she did not like skiing. And <laughs> my husband was like, no, we need to make it fun. And it just needs to be about play. And um, that was really a light bulb moment is just like, whatever is fun um, for her. And just we pretend we're animals out there. We hit jumps, we do silly things. Um, and then we definitely stop before they're done just make it fun every time, leave them wanting more. That way they're ready to go back the next time is um, what has worked for us with skiing. And now with COVID, it's like the thing they can do where they can see their friends in a somewhat safe manner. Um, so it's a really fun, sweet activity for them right now, especially. Yeah, keep them coming back for more. Yeah, leave the party before um, the party gets bad, you know? Metaphor <laughs> <laughs> for life. Yeah. Um, this is uh, just a commentary um, and kudos uh, to Ingrid from Miranda Hartridge. Miranda says, she just wanted to say you seem super humble and grateful uh, and that she loves how you recognize the relationships that propel you and that you are an amazing skier. Oh, thanks, Miranda. Um, we've got a couple more good ones here um, from Helen. She says, given the current state of the planet, what are your thoughts, feelings on the relatively high environmental impact of competitive athletics and the outdoors industry overall? Um, there's a couple questions in here. Mostly I'm thinking of the frequent flying and glo global lifestyle involved, but also short lifespan of most gear, snow production industry, et cetera. And she also says, thanks for being awesome. Oh, thanks. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I mean, I think about that a lot. I, as someone who promotes this or does this, and I've been able to, fortunate to do a lot of travel, um, I don't feel it's really my place to say, well, now no one can travel. Um, since I've experienced it and gotten to do it, well, now no one should. Um, I definitely, I guess I'm the naive optimist that hopes that we can all try to limit the non-essential travel, but that it's really important if you have that dream trip um, that we all, but there's nothing like traveling to meet people and connect the world. Um, and hopefully with COVID, it's helped us realize there's a lot of travel and stuff that we can eliminate and that isn't essential, um, that we can choose wisely and take, there's a dream trip that you're going to save up for, um, but we don't need to be blithely flying around the globe. Um, on a moment's notice, I don't think, I definitely don't feel that I want to anymore at all. Um, um, but also I hope that there's a way forward where people can continue to travel, um, but we can, there'll be a more responsible, energy efficient way that that can happen. If that makes sense, that's maybe the naive optimism part, but I don't think that we need to go back to no one ever traveling or horses and buggies. Um, 
Yeah, I, I remember a really awesome quote um, from Jeremy Jones when we chatted with him on our podcast. And he said, you know, I asked him similar questions like, what about animal agriculture when it comes to the environmental impact? What about, you know, um, transportation? What about all of these things that, you know, professional athletes could consider? And he said, look, man, you you can't let um, perfect get in the way of good. And so, you know, his point was, like, we all are hypocrites. We're all humans. We all have a footprint. But what steps can we take in our individual lives to, to make a better planet, you know? And I think you're, you're right. Like we can't just lop it off at the head, but there is lots of work to be done. Okay. Our last one, um, of course, uh, polarizing for you. Um, this is going to, um, divide families and, um, and upset people, crystal or squall from John. <laughs> Who's that one from? John Drawlinger. He's our local DPS rep. <clears throat> um, that is a really hard one. You got me, John. I don't, I don't think I could choose. I mean, Crystal is really special for a lot of reasons. Um, and I live up here in the Northwest now. Um, but I don't know, KT on a powder day? Whew, it's hard to beat. Depends on the day. I can't choose. I can't choose. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> They're both too good. And he yeah. also asks, how'd you settle on Leavenworth? Um, because Jim was living here. And, uh, yeah, I was living in Tahoe, and I met him. Um, and then I started visiting him here. And I kind of knew I was open to coming back to the Northwest at some point because my family's here. And, well, except for Ralph. Ralph's still in Tahoe, in Truckee. Um, but... Yeah, once I started visiting Leavenworth, it was like, oh, this is close to a mountain, um, and it's an amazing community, um, and Jim's here, and yeah, it just kind of felt right. Yeah, got to go with that. Plus, I could afford a house, which in Tahoe at the time I couldn't. <laughs> yeah, yeah. If we're going to be honest here. Yeah, no, you got you got to have rooms for those kids, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, that's all the questions we have. So, um, gosh, Ingrid, I can't thank you enough. I can't thank, you know, all your sponsors for supporting the event, all the money we've raised for the Tava Fund is just super overwhelming. So thank you for providing your story to our community and, and, uh, we hope to do it again one day. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks so much for having me. Thanks everyone for donating and for, um, yeah, being here and the awesome questions. Sweet. And uh, we'll see everyone on the 25th of February for Vasu Sohitra, uh, the last speaker of our series. I'm super fired up for, for Vasu. So see you then.